Hi, I'm Liz Fraser, I'm a GP in Canberra and this morning I'm going to be talking about metabolic syndrome from a doctor's perspective. So today I'll hope to tell you about what metabolic syndrome is, how to recognise it and what you can do about it because it is reversible with uh, diet and lifestyle. In case you're wondering, metabolic simply has to do with how the body stores utilizes and produces energy from fats and carbohydrates. The take home messages for today is that metabolic syndrome is extremely common. It's preventable and reversible. It can be recognized decades before there's overt disease like heart attack or diabetes. And it's also a concept that helps us connect many of the problems of aging. And I hope to help you understand how you might work with your GP towards better health as you age. Because you can change the direction of your life and your health. If you recognize yourself in what I'm about to say, you can do things differently and you can have a healthy old age. Where you're active in your garden, walking your dog, dancing, whatever it is that you enjoy doing with your life. You can take action now and you actually don't have to wait for a doctor to diagnose these problems. So we tend to talk about what we know best. I'm a GP, I'm um, in late middle age and I'm going to talk about how I manage these problems um, in patients in my practice who, many of whom are like me, aging baby boomers. They're often pushing 60 or getting older um, older than 60, maybe retired and sedentary, often overweight or obese, and they have a cluster of problems. And these problems include osteoarthritis of the hips and knees, high blood pressure, diabetes or prediabetes, this thing that we call cholesterol. Often there's a family history of cancer or they've had a cancer scare themselves like breast or colon cancer. There's often other problems like stress, anxiety and depression, sleep apnea, reflux, a fatty liver, a grumpy gut. Fortunately, nobody has all of these problems, but many will have at least several of these conditions. And are these all separate conditions? Well, the GP perspective is that, yes, they are all separate problems. Certainly GPs see them as separate problems and they all need different solutions. And the solution is usually a medication or perhaps in the case of um, osteoarthritis, say hip or knee replacement, or in the case of sleep apnea, a um, device, a CPAP device. But these conditions are very common, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, arthritis, diabetes, depression. And this is how people end up on lots of pills. We call this polypharmacy, but GPs will prescribe an anti-inflammatory for the arthritis, a proton pump inhibitor for the reflux, painkillers for the bad back, a couple of high blood pressure medications, a statin for the cholesterol, metformin for the diabetes, and then because the person feels lousy, there's an antidepressant. And they're also on low dose aspirin to prevent that stroke or heart attack. And then they're on the wait list for joint replacement surgery. Polypharmacy is actually quite a problem. All those medications potentially have drug, in, uh, drug side effects and they also interact with each other. And medication mishap is a major cause of um, hospitalizations, especially in older people. So medications keep you alive, but they don't make you well. So the question I'm asking you is, what do you want your old age to look like? Do you want to be taking a handful of pills daily? As the sage said, we're living longer. The bad news is the extra years are tacked on at the end. So those extra years are not necessarily good years. The same sage also said, Old age is not for sissies. Here's my typical patient again, female, close to 60, everything got worse after menopause. 
She's portly and carries a lot of weight around her middle. She's health conscious. She tries hard. She doesn't get to the gym as nearly as often as she'd like to. And she's an expert low-fat dieter, also called a yo-yo dieter. Perhaps it's not a bunch of unconnected things. Perhaps it's metabolic syndrome. So what is metabolic syndrome? It's a cluster of conditions. And there are five of them. Increased waist circumference, belly fat, so obesity. High triglycerides and low HDL, that's the cholesterol issue. High blood pressure and disturbed blood sugar. The official definition is that people meet at least three of those criteria. And the importance of this concept is that it's a marker of poor metabolic health and it predicts cardiovascular risk. That's the risk for stroke and heart attack. It's also incredibly common. About 40% of my patients over the 40% of the population over the age of 60 meet criteria for metabolic syndrome. It can progress to type 2 diabetes and type 2 diabetes has lots of complications. These are vascular complications to do with blood vessels in the brain leading to stroke, in the eyes leading to blindness, in the heart leading to a heart attack, in the kidneys leading to kidney disease, in the legs leading to infections, neuropathy and amputations. But you don't have to have type 2 diabetes in order to live a long, miserable life taking lots of pills. All of these apparently disparate phenomena, such as the blood glucose problem, the high blood pressure and the weight, can all be linked with a single underlying cause. Also, metabolic syndrome clusters with many of those other conditions that we've been talking about, like arthritis, the fatty liver and the reflux, memory loss and depression, cancers, joint problems. And what connects many of these things is insulin resistance. So what I'd like to talk about now is the question of insulin resistance, what it is and how do we develop it. We all know what insulin is. It's the hormone that lowers blood sugar. It does a lot of other things as well, and we'll come back to that. Insulin resistance is related to hyperinsulinemia. And the problem is that if your blood is full of insulin over time, your cells will become resistant to the effects of insulin. The insulin can't do its job properly. And We'll come back to this circular diagram, but at the moment, all I want you to note is that if you have excess insulin in your, in your blood, that's called hyperinsulinemia, that will over time lead to insulin resistance. If the liver is insulin resistant, glucose doesn't get into the liver. The liver starts thinking that your body is not getting enough glucose. And its job is to keep up the glucose supply. So it will churn out glucose and put it into your bloodstream and lead to increasing blood glucose levels. The problem is glucose is a poison. Now that's a pretty strong statement. Let me explain. Glucose kills you, it just kills you very slowly. Over time, if you have high blood glucose, the technical term is hyperglycemia, that glucose will attach itself to proteins and to fats and stop these things doing their proper work in our bodies. Getting back to insulin resistance. So cells resist insulin and uh, the liver churns out glucose and glucose levels rise. What comes first, insulin or hyperinsulinemia? Well, the reading that I've done suggests that hyperinsulinemia precedes the onset of obesity and is the first metabolic abnormality. Now, there's many things that can contribute to insulin resistance. Um, most importantly, the excessive 
refined carbohydrates in the diet, basically a Western diet, leads to high levels of insulin and hence to hyperinsulinemia. Also constant snacking. We get up in the morning, we have breakfast, by mid-morning we're having a snack, then you're thinking about lunch, and soon after lunch think people are thinking about snacks, and then pre-dinner snacks, and then dinner, and then what's, what's for dessert? So we're in the fed postprandial state for much of the day, and so our insulin levels never really get a chance to fall. What happens in the fasting state is that insulin levels drop, and uh, normally that's when our liver kicks into action and starts producing glucose to tide us through. Many things, some of the other things that contribute to insulin resistance are a genetic predisposition and I hear this from patients, they're obese, everyone in their family is obese or overweight and has got diabetes, it runs in their families. But there are other things too, lifestyle things such as less physical activity, disrupted sleep-wake cycles, chronic inflammation, um, omega-6-3 um, fatty acid imbalance and so forth. Let's think about why hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance are a problem. So this is getting back to that question about what insulin does in our bodies. It lowers blood sugar, that's not controversial, but it also prevents fat burning and promotes fat accumulation, especially around the middle. It's a growth factor, it's anabolic. That's great if you're young and you need to grow, but one, by the time you get to my age, you don't want things to grow and especially not cancer cells. Insulin leads to salt and water retention in the kidneys and increased blood pressure. It leads to higher triglycerides and lower HDL, that's the cholesterol connection. It also leads to hormonal disturbance and, uh, and inflammation. So in short, insulin resistance leads to metabolic syndrome and the things that are associated with the metabolic syndrome. Here's a photo of a gentleman with um, metabolic syndrome. He's got the classic increased waistline. He's also got the hormonal disturbance. You can tell that by his breast development. So what we're talking about is the whole big mess of chronic disease. A high dietary carbohydrate load, plus those other lifestyle factors and the genetic loading contribute to hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance leading to overweight and obesity and fat accumulation, systemic inflammation, arthritis, cardiovascular risk, depression, obesity, salt and water retention, the high blood pressure, disturbed little lipid metabolism, that's the cholesterol problem. Let me tell you, GPs put a lot of effort into managing chronic disease. We prescribe pills, we do care plans, we refer you off to the dietitian so you can fix up your diet to the physiotherapist and the exercise physiologist. We recommend that you go to the gym, you go and see the gastroenterologist, the cardiologist, the orthopaedic surgeon. It's complicated and it's tedious. What I want to do now is contract. Let's draw back from that big mess of chronic disease and just focus on cardiovascular risk. The reason we're going to do that is because as people age, the things they're most likely to die from are cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke. And look, it's probably pretty good if you die from it, but the problem is a lot of people don't die from it and are left with chronic illness and reduced quality of life. Here's a great big complex diagram. I'm going to talk you through it. So this big complex diagram summarizes all the things that we know about how diet contributes to cardiovascular disease. I'm going to walk you through it. The first thing to notice is down the bottom of the page are five orange boxes. 
these are the five hallmarks of cardiovascular disease. Just going through each of them, they are hypercoagulability, meaning increased tendency of blood to clot, hypercholesterolemia, hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia. The fourth is the inflammatory state. And the fifth is high blood pressure. What you need to note about this is that three of those are also criteria for metabolic syndrome. That is the cholesterol problem, the hyperglycemia, disturbed blood glucose problem, and the high blood pressure. The other two, the increased tendency of blood to clot and the inflammatory state, are arguably closely related to metabolic syndrome. And the point about all five of these hallmarks of cardiovascular disease are they all get worse with a high, high dietary carbohydrate load. I want to zoom in on one little area which is insulin resistance. It's in a pink box in the right hand side of the page in the middle area and like Rome um, many paths lead to insulin resistance and insulin re resistance leads to all the hallmarks of cardiovascular disease. What I'm arguing is that insulin resistance, the hallmarks of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome all get worse with high carb diets. And by the way, they all improve with low carbohydrate, healthy fat diets, and we'll get to that. But they're all basically the same thing. So if they are more or less the same thing, is there some way we can measure these? Well, yes, there is. There are lots of biomarkers and on the big complex diagram, they're the little red box things. And there's one that I'm going to talk about now, which is hemoglobin A1C, also known as HbA1c or just simply A1c. It does many things. What is it? Well, it's glucose attached to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin lives for about three months in your bloodstream. So it's reflecting your dietary glucose load over the past three months. The functions of A1C are, what it tells us is, it's a measure of diabetes. If your A1C is over 6.5, you've got diabetes. If you've got diabetes and your A1C is less than 7, your doctor will be really happy because that's um, an indicator of good control. We like diabetics who have got A1Cs of less than 7. But this is less well understood. A1C is also an indicator of cardiovascular risk because it reflects the impact of diet and particularly over the last three months. Um, and diet impacts cardiovascular risk by multiple mechanisms. HbA1c is actually predictive of cardiovascular risk. Cardiovascular risk rises with an HbA1c over 5. What I tell my patients is I would like to see your HbA1c less than 5. And I'm here to tell you that don't wait until your HbA1c is 6% and rising towards 6.5%. Do something about it sooner rather than later. On this particular graph, what we can see is a number of the things that predict cardiovascular risk. The things to note are LDL, which is a kind of cholesterol in red, but a little bit more on the right is the um, bar for HbA1c. It's actually a more powerful predictor of cardiovascular risk than LDL is. So LDL is not the only or even the most important biomarker, but it's the one that your doctor gets most excited about because they've got a pill for LDL. I think we should get more excited about your insulin levels and your A1C. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because metabolic syndrome is reversible. You don't have to wait until your A1C is rising. You don't have to wait for your GP to notice that. You can improve your health and lower your, your cardiovascular risk 
with a low carb healthy fat diet. I'm suggesting that you know what your numbers are and know what they mean. And also remember that dietary carbohydrate restriction can reduce or eliminate the need for medication for the components of metabolic syndrome like high blood pressure, diabetes and cholesterol. In this slide, the lady on the right is my friend and patient Jane and she's with her personal trainer outside her gym. In 2017, Jane was a classic case of metabolic syndrome. Her BMI was 42, which put her in the morbidly obese category. She certainly carried a lot of weight around her middle. She had mild high blood pressure. She had insulin resistance. Her triglycerides were high and her HDL was low. So she met all the criteria for metabolic syndrome. She also had some of the classic cluster of comorbidities. She had the fatty liver and she had an arthritic knee and she was on the public wait list for a knee replacement surgery. To top it all off, she felt awful. In her own words, she was ready to lie down and die. Jane and I talked and uh, she decided that she wanted to feel fabulous by the age of 60. She was um, in her late 50s. And the first thing she did was, she was already exercising at the gym. The thing that she added was she added a low carbohydrate diet. From 2018, she started intermittent fasting. She kept up with her exercise program and she had a lot of enthusiasm. Over two years, she lost 25% of her body weight. That's over 25 kilos. Her BMI has come down to around 32. So in fact, she's still technically obese, but her waist circumference has diminished dramatically. Her triglycerides are now low and her HDL has risen. She no longer has insulin resistance. And importantly, she no longer meets the criteria for metabolic syndrome. To top it all off, she feels great. She's very energetic and enthusiastic about life. She also took herself off the wait list for that knee replacement. And the fatty liver resolved inside six months. And she did all this without any new medications. I call her my metabolic miracle. If you ask Jane about whether low carb eating is sustainable, she'll tell you that she really enjoys eating and enjoys the food that she eats. She's not hungry. She's gained health and she's really looking forward to a healthy, active old age. From my point of view, is it sustainable? Well, have a look at her cardiovascular risk profile. In 2017, using the numbers, her cardiovascular risk profile was 7%, which means if we had 100 women like Jane, something of the order of seven of them would have some kind of catastrophic event like a stroke or a heart attack in the next five years. In 2019, she's reversed metabolic syndrome. The numbers have come down to 3%. So she's more than halved her cardiovascular risk with a low carb, healthy fat diet. In the last 10 minutes or so of this talk, I'm going to discuss how you might talk with your doctor about low carbohydrate diets and biomarkers. And many doctors get very hung up on LDL and dietary fats. There's this big fear that the fat is going to kill you. The usual story goes something like this, and I hear this story from new patients from time to time. I went low carb, my doctor said my cholesterol was bad and that I needed to take a statin. I refused to take new medication. The doctor got very upset. We had an argument and I didn't go back to that doctor. This story was told to me by a lady, I'll call her Helen. Here are the numbers from her cholesterol result in 2018. This was when the doctor told her that she had to take a statin or she was going to die. Let's have a close look at these numbers. Her HDL is 1.5. Actually, that's pretty good. Her triglycerides are 1.1. .1.
that's all right. It's actually technically in the normal range, could be a bit lower, but it's not too bad. But red alert, look at her LDL, it's 4.2, that's elevated. Clearly, Helen needs to take that statin or she's at risk of a heart attack. So what doctors know is that LDL is certainly implicated in atherogenesis. That's the process uh, by which plaque form in, forms in coronary arteries, which is the precursor to a heart attack. Doctors really truly believe that lowering LDLs with statins will save your life, probably by next week. But should we be worried about LDL? It's not actually part of the metabolic syndrome criteria. What I'm going to talk about is how someone like Helen, maybe you, can talk to your GP about your LDL and your cardiovascular risk. The first thing I'm going to mention is um, Helen could ask for a cardiovascular risk assessment. This page shows the Australian Heart Foundation's clinical guidelines for doctors. And what they say is for people aged between 45 and 75 years without existing cardiovascular disease, do a risk assessment. What that means is look at the big picture. Assess, consider their age, the gender, their smoking status, their blood pressure, their total to HDL ratio, not their LDL. Are they diabetic or not? and use a, cal a risk calculator to work out what their, to estimate their cardiovascular risk. If they're high risk, yes, by all means, a statin may provide some benefits. But if they're low or moderate risk, if they're moderate risk, the recommendation is six months of intensive lifestyle uh, to improve the cardiovascular risk. Let's talk for a moment about cardiovascular risk calculators. There are any number online. Here's an example of the Australian cardiovascular risk calculator. It's pretty easy to use. You put your numbers in, you press a button and it um, shows, tells you what your estimated risk over the next five years is. The UK has got a more sophisticated calculator called QRISC3. You can also find that online. Interestingly, none of these risk calculators include the LDL number. When I put Helen's numbers into the Australian cardiovascular risk calculator, this is the result, 3%. She's female, she's age 50, she's a non-smoker, she's got normal blood pressure, her total to HDL ratio is 4, she's not diabetic, she's low risk. Basically, I told her, I don't think you need a statin, but because she was obese and I didn't know what her HbA1c was, I said, I do want to know what your HbA1c is and I'd also like to know what your fasting glucose and insulin are because I think they give better information. The next thing that someone like Helen might ask that doctor who's desperate to prescribe a statin is, what kind of LDL do I have? Now, LDL is not one thing. There's actually many different kinds of LDL. I'm gonna break it down into two broad categories. There's type A LDL, which is large and buoyant, and it's low risk. It's non-atherogenic. It doesn't, it's not associated with heart disease. There's also small dense LDL, we call that profile B. And it has a stronger association, a much stronger association with heart disease. Let's have a look at the impact of diet on the biomarkers for cardiovascular disease. This study compared people on a low carbohydrate with a low fat diet. And what we see is that after 12 weeks, the people on the low carbohydrate diet had more weight loss, more waist loss, lower insulin and blood sugar levels, their A1C got better, their HDL went up and their triglycerides went down, which is what we want. So it looks like all those markers of metabolic syndrome reversed. But what happened to their LDL on a low carb diet? 
Well, we really have to zoom in on this diagram. And what we see is that the people on the low carbohydrate diet, their small, dense, toxic LDL went down. The people on the low fat diet, the small, dense, atherogenic LDL went up. So this makes sense. If you're reversing your metabolic syndrome and reversing um, your cardiovascular risk, um, and your HDL goes up and your blood pressure comes down and your A1C improves, it, what it tells us is that your LDL profile is likely to become non-atherogenic, which is consistent with the metabolic syndrome in reverse. In this case, Helen's raised LDL is irrelevant. The number doesn't matter. What I'd like you to remember is if your doctor tells you that you need to take a statin for raised LDL, ask them for a lipid subfraction. It will give you more information on which to base your decision. If your triglycerides are low and your HDL is high, then your LDL is likely to be the low risk variety. The third thing that people like Helen can um, the third thing they can ask their doctors is what about the number needed to treat? The abbreviation is NNT. The number needed to treat is a concept which tells us how many people do we need to treat with this medication in order for one person to benefit. For example, preventing one catastrophic event such as stroke or heart attack and the typical time frame is five years. So here's a website called the NNT.com and here is their um, answer for that question, will Helen benefit from taking a statin? Helen hasn't got prior heart disease and the number needed to treat is about a hundred, meaning we would need to treat a hundred women like Helen for five years in order to prevent one of them from having some kind of cardiovascular event. So for someone like Helen with no prior heart attack and low cardiovascular risk, there are few benefits from taking statin medication and the harms are likely to outweigh the benefits. The other way that I look at this is if I prescribe this drug to lower my patient's cholesterol, how much extra life will it give her? Here's an answer from a paper that was published in the BMJ in 2015. It took the data from the big statin trials. Down the left hand column you'll see the names of those big trials like Allhat, Ascot, Jupiter, Wascops, 4S. What they looked at was the mortality curves. Does taking a statin compared to a placebo shift the mortality curve? And the answer is yes, it did, but not by much. On the right column, you can see the measure of how much extra life people got from taking a statin compared to taking a placebo. And in all cases, the benefit is modest and is measured in terms of days, not years, days. So Helen might expect somewhere between four and an extra 30 days of life if she takes a statin. Let's go back to that big complex diagram. Remember I said that the small red, uh, little red arrows show the biomarkers. LDL is in there somewhere. It's not the only and it's not the most important biomarker of cardiovascular risk. A reminder, the Australian guidelines recommend looking at the big picture. And in the big picture, Metabolic syndrome and its biomarkers are actually better predictors of cardiovascular risk than LDL alone. So this is a rather long-winded way of saying that metabolic syndrome can be reversed with a low carbohydrate, healthy fat diet. And other speakers at this weekend's conference will talk about how you can do that. Oh look, there's the LDL. If we zoom in on that diagram, 
What I'm trying to say is that doctors' concerns about LDL are frequently overstated. In the summary, metabolic syndrome is increasingly common as we age. It increases your cardiovascular risk. But the good news is the metabolic changes can be detected decades before there's frank diabetes or even a heart attack. Metabolic syndrome is made worse on a high carbohydrate diet. It can be reversed with a low carb healthy fat diet. And by the way, that will also improve lots of the other health conditions that we think of as a normal part of aging. And changing your diet, reducing dietary carbohydrate, can reduce the need for medication. A big barrier to implementing a low carb diet is doctors' fears of dietary fats and fear about LDL cholesterol. But low carbohydrate diets improve the biomarkers of metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular risk. And in this context, the LDL number is likely to be irrelevant. Many doctors don't get this, and you might be the person who has to educate your doctor. You can do this by asking for a cardiovascular risk assessment, asking about LDL subfractions, and asking about the number needed to treat if you're told to take a statin or die. If you would like to follow up the references, the last slide includes the main papers that I've used to inform this talk. This is the finish of my presentation and I really hope that you've got something from this that um, if you see yourself in the picture that I've described, I hope you've got something that helps you understand the numbers that your doctor um, is interested in, and I hope that it helps you have a more intelligent conversation with your doctor about those numbers. Thank you so much for listening.